how, how easy was it to beat the testers? The teams that I was on had really good doctors and they would help you, they would tell you what you could take and how much you could take and how far out from a race you could take it. Um, so pretty much, there were some simple rules you had to follow and if you followed them, um, it wasn't hard to pass these tests. The time in late 2000 uh, when a tester shows up at your home. Yeah. What do you recall? Um, I had, had a patch on the night before and probably left it on for too long and I, I wasn't 100% sure that if I took a test at that moment that I'd pass, be negative. And, and to me it wasn't worth the stress of having to wait for three or four weeks to get that result back. Mm -hmm. So uh, so set the scene, there's a knock on the door. Yeah, there was a knock on the door. Um, looked at my ex-wife, she looked at me, I gave her the kind of the wide eyes like, it's not good. And we just both hit the deck, hit the floor, just remained totally silent. Uh, so for, I don't know, three, four hours, it, every few minutes the guy would come up and pound on the door. Just had to keep quiet, totally avoided the test and, uh, you know, messed with the system, unfortunately. Explain the trick on the whereabouts form. Yeah, you know, back in, you know, they started the out of competition tests um, in the year 2000. And, um, you know, if you're going to catch the cheaters, that's the way to catch them, you know. Typically, you're not going to show up on, on race day, you know, glowing or with any performance enhancing products in your system. And glowing is the term for that. Yeah, we call it glowing. But you catch them when you're outside, of, outside of, you know, when you're home training. And uh, so sometimes to avoid the testers, you'd have to give your whereabouts, you'd just give them some remote location in the Spanish Pyrenees or, or uh, the French Alps. It was too, too much of a hassle to get up there to test one athlete, so. They would, um, you wouldn't have a problem. And sometimes, you, you, sometimes you say you're here, but you're actually there. You're actually at home. Or other times, um, yeah, you just you could manipulate the system. When you were racing, what percentage of the peloton do you believe was using? Um, phew, hard to say exactly, uh, but the majority. I'd be, you know. I'd be surprised if it was as low as like 85 or 90 percent. You'd be surprised if it was as low as 85 or 90 percent? Yeah. Really? Meaning, yeah, it might, might have been more. You know, in my career, in the, in the major part of my career, but between 97 and 2004, there were only two individual cyclists at that level who came out and spoke against doping, like publicly. Two. You know, everybody else, and to, everybody knew there was people were doping. You know, you would have to be very, very oblivious to everything if you somehow didn't know there was doping going on. So I have a hard time buying. You know, you know, some of my ex teammates have gone on to say like, "Oh, I didn't realize there was doping going on." I don't know. Maybe they had their head, head in the sand. I don't know. But it was pretty clear. What's the likelihood any cyclist could consistently finish? at the top or around the top of a race without using performance enhancing drugs? Uh, you know, back then, I can't speak for cycling it, it, today, back, but back, back then, then right? back in the sort of the dark era of cycling, um, highly, highly, highly unlikely. In a race like the Tour, I would say almost impossible.